so let's look over the questions here from the quiz. So number one, as used today, the, which term best describes the celestial sphere? I put in the as used today because at one point people thought this was true. And so at that point it would have been a theory. But now the celestial sphere here is a model. It's a useful way for us to, to visualize the system. It's a model. Then what term in astronomy uh -oh. is used in astronomy. Now it's still grammatically okay. To describe the point directly over your head, what is it? Zenith. Zenith. Now let's um I forgot. Let's let's go to the first one. What is a what is a theory? A tested hypothesis. A, te a hypothesis has been tested a number of times so that people have confidence in it. What's a hypothesis then? Educated guess. It's kind of an untested idea. And what is a law? So someone used to explain something like help us whatever, but it usually is like equations or something like that. Okay, it's a, it's a theory that is very general, covers a broad range, and can often be expressed in a simple equation. All right, the second one, declination. What is declination? <laughs> it's the what? It's the longitude, but on the scale. The other one. Latitude. It's like latitude. It's the north and south measurement yeah. in the sky. On the... What is the nadir? The point below. Directly below the feet. Zenith directly above, celestial pole. Yeah. If you were standing at the North Pole, it'd be your zenith, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, now the next one. Which unit is defined as the average distance between the sun and the earth? Astronomical unit. What is the parsec? No, it's, it's large. It's the largest of all of these. One of them is not a unit, by the way. Yeah. The parsec is the distance um, to an object that makes a parallax angle of one arc second. We didn't define it that way in class just you know here is the most the biggest unit a parsec is 3.26 light years what's a light year the distance light travels in one year so it's a distance and it's a long distance but the parsec is a little bit longer the reason i put the parsec in there is because it has that word parallax the reason the big reason that people didn't believe that the Earth moved was because they saw no parallax. They saw no relative changing of positions. Okay, um, <laughs> the ecliptic, what is the ecliptic? It's certainly not a distance. It's the path. Now, we're being correct today. The Earth takes as it orbits the sun. Right, I always said the path the sun appears to take. Appears makes it correct because, of course, the sun's not going around the earth, but it appears from earth as if. Final one. And this one was the hardest one because it's just a straight historical question, but it's a really important one. In fact, in the homework, you have to give four good reasons why the earth is a sphere and not flat. Um, here's one of them. With his measurements of the shadow angle in Syene and Alexandria, what did Eratosthenes establish over 200 years before the birth of Christ? that the Earth is a sphere with a radius of approximately 13,000 kilometers. He, remember, saw that the angle, well, the sun went to the very bottom of a well, so it had to have been exactly straight overhead, and he realized, hey, if I you know, have somebody measure, like in Alexandria, what the angle is at the same time, we can determine what the angular distance is, and then we can calculate how much of a full circle it is away and calculate the radius. Literally, I okay. was reading that and I was like, oh my gosh, how can I get a hint? This is a history thing, but if he spend a lot of time talking about, I'm like, hey, that's a sphere. I'm just gonna screw it. Great. All right. I am going to now maybe. I'd be willing to bet there's a way to close this app. 
Well, I'm going to close it this way because having that app open screws up my presentation for the rest of the class. Now it's closed and it won't screw up my presentation for the rest of the class. Genius, right? Right. Question, Mira. We weren't given the homework this Um, I didn't get it done until this morning. Okay. I I was helping somebody with calculus. <laughs> um, so we're talking about the advent of modern astronomy. So last class period we talked about some of the ancient astronomy things, how Aristotle believed that we had the crystalline sphere that was the celestial sphere with all the stars on it. And then inside that celestial sphere were concentric spheres with the planets on them. And then Ptolemy said, well, that can't be right because we have a retrograde motion. We have the stars normally appear to move just a little bit, or the planets, excuse me, appear to move just a little bit east every night compared to the celestial sphere. Except for there are periods of time when they have retrograde or backward motion where they start moving west compared to the stars. And then they go back to east. And he said that can't be explained with things just doing circles around the earth. And so he came up with the idea of the little epicycles of a wheel on the sphere so that it's centered on a sphere going like this, but it's on this wheel. So sometimes this motion on the wheel is coming back so they can get the retrograde motion. Nicholas Copernicus is credited with proposing the heliocentric universe. That is that the sun is the center of the solar, of, well, the universe is what they believe that. He's not the first person to come up with it. We talked about that before. But he was, let's say, the last one. After he proposed it, the idea didn't die and was eventually adopted. It wasn't adopted, though, because of him. Really? There we go. Okay. Because that was why I killed the other thing, because it messed that up. So, Copernicus did his reasoning by using some more vocabulary words. We've got a lot of vocabulary words already. Here's some more. He looked at positions. Now, I have slides for these individual ones. But this diagram shows all of the different words we're going to learn here. Okay? Conjunction, superior conjunction, inferior conjunction, opposition, and quadrature. So let's get to it. Opposition. Opposition is when something, well, generally when we say opposition, it's implied opposition with the sun. So opposition with the sun means it's opposite directions to the sun. So let us say that all one, that's the time I'm saving. So all one is the sun. So if I'm here, all one is this direction, Juliet's that direction. So Juliet would be in opposition to all one. But we don't say to all one or to the sun. We just say Juliet's in opposition, and it's implied to the sun. So it's pretty simple. When a planet is in opposition, it is on the opposite side of you from the sun. Now, of course, only planets that orbit the sun farther away than the Earth can be on the opposite side of the sun. We call planets that orbit farther from the Earth superior planets. So what is the next superior planet to the Earth? The next one farther away from the Sun? Oh, Mars. Mars. So Mars is a superior planet, then Jupiter, then Saturn, then Uranus, then Neptune. Those are the superior planets. The inferior planets are the ones that are closer to the Sun. So that would be... Mercury and Venus are the two inferior planets to the Earth. If you were on Jupiter, well, you'd be dying, but let's not worry about that. Then Mars, Earth, Venus, and Mercury would all be inferior planets to you. Wait, so the point of knowing this is, a, is, this, is it like saying this one's superior to Earth? Or? Superior doesn't mean better. It means farther no, from the sun. No, yeah, it's yes. going to be like farther. Yes. So you could say it like it's superior than Earth. Superior to Earth. Okay. Yeah. Superior to Earth. There you go. And if, if it's not qualified, they always mean to Earth, right? Yeah. So, you know, this is just jargon, so when astronomers are talking, you can follow what they're saying. When we're talking about he did this, you can follow what's saying. So opposition, only superior planets can be in opposition. Then we have conjunction. Conjunction is when you have a planet on the same line as the sun. 
So opposition is on the same line as well, but on the opposite side, so conjunction is on the same side. So putting the sign in the middle and then putting the conjunction. That is called a superior conjunction. Okay. And an inferior conjunction is when it's between you and the sign. Only inferior plants can have an inferior conjunction. Um, a superior planet cannot have an inferior conjunction, so when it has a conjunction, they just call it a conjunction. Don't worry about saying superior. You don't need to qualify it if it's a superior planet because it can't have an inferior conjunction. If it's an inferior planet, when it's on the opposite side, it's the superior conjunction because it's the farther away of the two. Remember, superior, farther away. So conjunctions are when you look at the sun and there's a planet either between you and the sun or directly on the other side of the sun. Then there's quadrature, and this one's the most confusing one. Quadrature is when a line going from the sun to the planet, well, to one planet to another planet, is a right angle. If it's a superior planet, it's done the way it's shown in this picture. If we're looking for quadrature with the superior planet, then the line that goes from the sun to the earth to the superior planet is a right angle when it's a quadrature. If it's an inferior planet, you can't have that. So if it's an inferior planet, then we switch to the Earth being the one out here and the inferior planet's the one here. That is confusing. Yes, yeah, like I said, it is, it is the most confusing one. So, wait, can you explain that one more time, please? The... Quadrature is when you have a right angle between the line going from the sun to one planet to the next planet. Oh, so if it goes like this. Yeah, okay. which is shown, you see the two plants that are shown with quadrature, uh -huh. and see how there's a right angle between the line going from the sun to the planet. Okay. So, um, <laughs> I, think, I think I'll come back to Copernicus's actual method here in a few slides, but I want to stay with this right now. <laughs> Observational facts things that you can observe. Elongation, yet another vocabulary word. I am throwing a lot of vocabulary words out there. Next class period, I'll review vocabulary words again at the start of class. So elongation is the angle from the sun to a planet. Right? Wrong. Well, like I said, elongation is, yeah, that was right. The angle from the sun to the planet as viewed from Earth. And as viewed from Earth, Mercury's elongation is never greater than 28 degrees. You always find Mercury within 28 degrees of the Sun. Now that makes observing Mercury kind of difficult because you, you have 28 degrees, which is roughly three times four, one twelfth of a day or two hours is the maximum time out of sunset that Mercury can be in the sky. <clears throat> it's usually going to be less than that. Or it's the maximum time before sunrise that Mercury can be in the visible sky. So Mercury is never going to be visible at midnight, ever, unless you're somewhere where sundown comes after 10 p.m. So that's one of the reasons Mercury is hard to observe. Now, Mercury is super bright. You know why it's super bright? It's close to the sun, and all of our planets, they don't generate light, they reflect light. So being close to the sun, it's getting a whole lot more sunlight, hence it can reflect a lot more. Now, its albedo, its reflectivity, isn't very high. Does that Venus have the most? Have what? Does, isn't Venus has, like, the most reflectivity? Um, Venus has a very high albedo, very high reflectivity. It's also very bright. And Venus is also reasonably close to the sun. That's our second one. Venus is never more than 47 degrees elongation. So it's never more than 47 degrees away from the sun. So once again, Venus, instead of, you know, two hours, you basically have three hours, I think it is, before or after the sun sets, rises, when you can see Venus. So both of those are not going to be visible in the middle of the night. How do you explain that? 
if they're going around the earth, it seems like they should at some time be opposite to the sun, right? And so that was a problem for the heliocentric model, or for, excuse me, for the geocentric model, the model that everything's going around the sun. But that was fixed. That was fixed by changing a little bit how the celestial spheres work. Um, I have a picture, okay, this is actually talking about Copernicus's work. I have a picture coming up in like four or five slides, but I'm going to jump right to it. Seriously, I'm going to jump right to it, unless I deleted it like a genius. <laughs> I must have deleted it because I've gone a long ways. <laughs> yeah, okay. We got a long ways to go. There it is. Okay, here is the modification. Notice there's a line going from the sun to the earth. And so Ptolemy's model to account for the fact that Venus has a maximum elongation of 47 degrees and that Mercury has a maximum elongation of 28 degrees, he drew a line from earth to the sun and pinned the epicycles for Venus and Mercury on that line. So their epicycles always have to be on the same line as the Earth-Sun line, and that way they maintain those maximal elongations instead of sometimes being opposite. Yes? So what is the point or whatever for elongations or whatever? I feel like I still don't, like I get it. It's like the angular or whatever from the sun or whatever. Or to the sun, but like I'll, I'll talk about some more, and hopefully it'll make more sense when I talk yeah. about it again, because it's it's an important piece of a heliocentric versus a geocentric model. And oh my goodness, I'm going to be going back through 29 slides. Okay, I don't have 29 slides in the presentation, but it feels like it. Oh, hey, look, I could have just come here right at the beginning, but no, I was what one slide away from getting to it, and I hit that button. All right, so here's where we are. Um, so Copernicus measured the time that it took for a planet to go from conjunction to quadrature, and using that and some sophisticated little math, because they weren't dummies, he came up with these distances from the sun to each planet. You look at the middle column there, and that's Copernicus's distances. You look at the final column, and that's the actual distance we have today. And what you notice is the only one that has any significant variance from the correct is Saturn. He was pretty much spot on. That's good work, right? Of course, they didn't have our more sophisticated measurements now to back him up. <laughs> now, <clears throat> Copernicus's model explained the retrograde motion in a simple fashion. If we look at a heliocentric model, you have all of the planets orbiting around the sun, including the Earth. And so having two planets orbiting around the Earth, here we show Mars and Earth. And as they're coming around, when they're close to lined up, now what would we call this position at D? We're on Earth, so we're right here. It's not a conjunction because conjunctions need to be on the side toward the sun. So what do we call it it's on the opposite side? Opposition. Opposition, yeah. So this is where there's an opposition. So at the time when you're approaching opposition, it turns out that if you look at the angle, from the Earth to Mars, here it's pointing out there, here it's come that direction, here it's come that direction more, so it was normal motion up to C, but then, because the Earth is going faster, the angle shifts back this way. And so you have retrograde motion going on between C and E. So retrograde motion is just a straight requirement of heliocentric orbit, a system, with us all orbiting the sun. Whereas with the Ptolemaic model, he had to come up with those 
epicycles, uh, a much more convoluted explanation. Now, this is where I always bring up Occam's razor. You had a question? Yeah, I was just going to say, so retrograde is just like, it says the Earth passes the planet. Like any planet in general? Or it's it's actually true. Anytime we pass a planet, so we're going like to have retrograde motion observed. This? Like well, we're all going the same direction. Yes. Yeah, so. And so anytime, if it's a superior planet, we're going to be catching up with it. If it's an inferior planet, it's going to oh, be so catching it's up just with it. So like the like that's, yeah. Okay. Was that why they have the Mercury? That's why they have the Mercury. Retrograde? Mercury has a retrograde period as well. Um, I'm not sure if you get a context for it or something. So. It's just a big thing. I need to read up there. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so the heliocentric model gives you a simple explanation for why you have retrograde motion. The Ptolemaic model is a complicated one. Occam's razor is something that is used in logical arguments to help decide which of two competing theories that both work you should accept. And Occam's razor says the simpler explanation, if you have two equally good explanations, it's generally going to be the best one. So Occam's razor would say, Copernicus. But people didn't accept Copernicus's model. This is another homework question. Why would people not accept the simpler model if it gives you equally good results? Ideas? <laughs> the church. Okay. The, the church definitely was a big factor. It's a good call. Not too simple, I suppose. There's no such thing as too simple, although often on tests you think, oh, you could be asking something that simple and you try to do something harder. <laughs> Two really good reasons. Number one is, well, it didn't give any better predictions than a model that people had believed for 1,500 years. What have we believed for 1,500 years? Not very much. Okay, we have believed that the Earth is a sphere for more than 1,500 years. But... That's a really long time to believe the same thing. Pretty much everybody was 100% certain it was true. And so, as you've heard, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And that was considered an extraordinary claim that what had been believed for 1,500 years wasn't correct. And number two is the fact that, yeah, it didn't give any better predictions. It wasn't spot on. The Ptolemaic model had started off giving really good predictions, and then over time, it got worse and worse at making predictions. So you can have predictions that are off by a degree or two for where a planet would be each night. But the Copernican model didn't give any better predictions. So they both were giving imperfect predictions. Why would you take the new one over the old one? You believe it already. Yeah. So it's because they didn't give very, a very, any better explanation or? Well, it didn't give any better predictions, predictions? of planet positions. Oh, okay. It, it gave, Reasonably close, but still not perfect predictions. Now we enter Tycho Brahe. Tycho Brahe is just a really interesting cat. If you look at the picture there, you can't tell because it's just not high enough resolution. But he has a prosthetic nose piece. Now, I went and visited the homelands, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Germany, a summer ago. It's awesome. My family name from Norway is Veen, so I always wondered like if there's some kind of relation here because he became the ruler of Veen. But I think it was a different Veen. Right? Veen was the location my family's from in Norway. Um, anyhow, to his nose, he was he was from a wealthy family. He went to university as wealthy people and only wealthy people did back then. And in university, he and another classmate got into a little dust up. Back then, when you got into an argument that just could not be resolved in any other way, it went to the pistols. You have a duel. And so he and a fellow student had a duel. Paced it off, 
turned and fired, and he clearly lost because he got his nose blown off. I mean, he didn't die. Probably had a hard neck. Now, I always have to ask this because I think it's amazing. Two college-age young men. You guys, three of you are college-age young men. Three of you are college-age young women. What do you suppose these college-age young men had an argument about that was so severe they had to pull out the pistols? See, that's what I would have done with two. It seems so logical. It seems so logical. But no. Their argument was over who was a better mathematician. And somehow they couldn't work that out with pencil and paper. It had to go to guns. He was an interesting character. Political disputes, theological disputes, or historical disputes. God does not believe we should kill. I'm doing that win. Okay, I'm sorry. Probably a sad religious. Staying up there, I okay. So Tico Brahe, why are we talking about Tico Brahe? He's interesting, obviously. But Tico, when he was in, I think it was when he was in college, even maybe it was just after, he observed a new star. It's called Tico's Nova. Nova being Latin for new, or or I understand Spanish for doesn't go, hence the Chevy Nova, not such a big sell in, in Spanish speaking countries. So Tico discovers this nova, this new star, a star suddenly appearing where there was not a star. That was groundbreaking. Keep in mind, the Catholic Church had taken the ideas of Aristotle and Lastos. And Aristotle believed that everything outside of the earth was perfect, but the earth was imperfect. And we can see that the moon has some flaws on it. So, well, that makes sense. The moon's so close to the Earth that the imperfections of Earth are marring. And if you have perfection, you shouldn't have change. Right? You can't go from, it's perfect. Oh, now it's more perfect. Like, that's not possible. It's either perfect or not perfect. And so, if it was perfect, then the new star made it imperfect. If it wasn't perfect, yeah. And so, there was a very strong, it shouldn't change. And yet, here he saw a new star. So, he became very famous. Now, of course, if you had not been in European society, this would have been a big deal. Asian scholars had noticed many such stars in the past, but they didn't have the communications and whatnot. So the king of Denmark set him up there in the being where he had the world's best observatory. He used high-precision instruments for precise astronomical observations and meticulously recorded his data. Here's his state-of-the-art, most advanced observatory in the world. This is a picture, of course. In this picture, we have Tycho Brahe. Anybody have an idea where Tycho might be? In the chair. In which chair? There are three people sitting in chairs. This here is the painting in his observatory, a painting of him in his observatory. This here is Tycho making measurements. Now he's making measurements. What do you have here? You have a very carefully calibrated angle measuring device. And up here, what do you have there? A hole in the wall. And so he has his chair here, and he has a little sight that he can move. And he recorded when stars and planets were visible through that hole in the wall and what angle they were visible from. That was the state-of-the-art observatory for the day. There wasn't telescope or anything like that. And so this guy here is the scribe who is recording the data. So he says, now the scribe records the time and the angle and which object it is. Now there's one other fellow in this. Who do you suppose that fellow is? He looks like what? He looks like he's cleaning. Cleaning? Kind of does. I believe that's his jester. He had a jester who was supposed to have slept under the table. He would like feed him table scraps and you know he would tell jokes and 
a, a dwarf and keep him entertained. A very interesting guy is Tycho Brahe. So Tycho Brahe made a lot of very accurate measurements. It says here he witnessed a supernova. It was called Tycho's Nova. They didn't know the difference in a supernova and a nova back then because they didn't know what either of them were. It was just something new. So he's got the world's greatest observatory. He hires Johannes Kepler to come work for him. Johannes Kepler had graduated from the university, got a job as a teacher, and he was awesome at that job. He taught first semester, and then it comes second semester, and no students would sign up for his classes. <laughs> um, so a little bit of a failure there as a professor, but he had a very keen intellect. He saw interesting patterns. This here is a picture indicating one of the patterns he saw. Now this pattern has actually no known scientific um, relationship, but he said he realized that you could make a set of regular um, solids um, with different numbers of sides. So here you have one, two, three, four, five, six sides, not that. Four, five, six, seven, eight sides, and so on. Different number of sides for each one. And you could make a container that stacked them in boxes and fit each one of the planetary spheres, the spheres that these planets on, according to the Ptolemaic model, between those regular objects. It was really interesting. Tycho recognized that this guy was really good at math, something that Tycho Brahe, turns out, wasn't as good as you would think for somebody who had a duel over it. So Tycho hired him to come in and work in his lab. Soon after Tycho hired him, I shouldn't have gone forward, but soon after Tycho hired him, Tycho died. There's plenty of stories about how Tycho died. Um, could have been poisoning, could have been this, that, or the other thing. The good story is a student, I used to tell my students this, and then a student said, you know, I looked it up, and that's just not possible, was that he was having a, it was eight days after he had a meal with the king of Denmark when he died. He collapsed at the table and died eight days later. And the story that I was told initially that I thought was a great story was that it was rude to stand up in the presence of the king, he had to go to the bathroom, he refused to go to the bathroom and, and cause him you know, to have a urinary problem that killed him, but apparently that, that's not possible. Too bad. Anyway, so Tico dies. He, before he died, said that he wanted Johannes Kepler to inherit everything, to inherit his observatory, his data, the whole nine yards. But of course, Tico Brahe was from a wealthy family. When Tico died, the wealthy family said, we don't care what Tico wanted. That's our family stuff. And so there was a long protracted legal battle. And of course, when you have a wealthy person and a poor person in a legal battle, it's always the wealthy one that wins, right? They can buy justice. And so Johannes Kepler lost everything, but because that shit is not just the law. He kept the data <laughs> and just didn't hand it over, which is a benefit to society in large. Because he observed Tycho Brahe's data. Now, Tycho Brahe was trying to come up with a new variation on the Ptolemaic model with the epicycles and whatnot to, to make better predictions. And it was really complicated, his model. So Kepler gets the data, and he realized pretty quickly that there were some patterns here that Tycho and or anyone else had observed. And what he observed was that circular motion, as Copernicus said, Copernicus's model said that the planets are doing perfect circles around the sun. He said, it's not circular motion. It's elliptical motion. And furthermore, it's not uniform. It's not a constant speed of orbit. The planets are speeding up and slowing down as they orbit the sun. And by allowing for the planets to speed up and slow down, and for elliptical orbits rather than circular orbits, he came up with a model that perfectly predicted the positions of the planets. So you go from Ptolemy, everybody's believed it for 1,500 years, to Copernicus, no one accepted it because it doesn't make any better predictions, to boom, spot on predictions. What are you going to do then? 
you kind of have to accept the new model because it's giving you the correct prediction. The old one can't give you the correct one you have one that does, you have to accept it. So Johannes Kepler came up with a model that was heliocentric. The planets are orbiting around the sun, not in circular orbits, but in elliptical orbits, stretched circles, if you will, ovals, with the sun at one of the focal points. And they're speeding up when they're closer to the sun and slowing down when they're farther from the sun. So we're going to go through those rules here. So the first one, just defining an ellipse. An ellipse is a stretched circle. So you can always make an ellipse. If you are stranded on a desert island, and for some reason you need an ellipse, all you have to do is, well, I'm assuming that you have some kind of vines or something so you can braid a rope. And you take that rope and you pound two pegs in the ground, and you just walk around keeping that rope tied to each peg and tight, and you will make an ellipse. Pretty simple to make an ellipse. Now, of course, you can make a circle if you just tied both ends of the rope to one peg, right? So a circle is just a special case of the ellipse. It's a special case where the radius doesn't change. The shape of the ellipse is defined by this term, the eccentricity. Now if you say, that Richard Webb, he's an eccentric dude. You're saying he's strange, right? When you're talking about an ellipse, when it's an eccentric ellipse, it's a strange circle. It's stranger if it's more eccentric. Eccentricity is between zero and one. One is a straight line. One would be just going straight back and forth like this. And zero is a perfect circle. The actual calculation of the eccentricity is taken by measuring what we call the semi-major axis. Major axis is the longest line you can draw on the ellipse. The semi-major axis is half of that, semi for half. And then you divide the distance from one of the two focal points to the center by that semi-major axis, and it gives you the eccentricity. So if the two focal points are at the same location, then the eccentricity is zero. So, that was the first of Kepler's three laws, that the planets do elliptical orbits around the sun with the sun, I actually didn't mention this, the sun as one of the two focal points. Those two pegs I said you put in the ground, those are the two focal points. The second one is a line from a planet to the sun sweeps over equal areas of time in equal, inter or equal areas in equal intervals of time. There is one take home for this. This picture, the blue hash shaded area, is the area swept out by a planet moving around the sun in a one month period. You can see those areas should be about the same, but the distance from A to B on your right hand side is much shorter than the distance from A to B on your left hand side. If it's the same amount of time, it's a short distance, it's going slower. So it's going slower out here and faster in here. Faster when it's closer to the sun, slower when it's farther away. So that's his second law. The important thing for you to remember the second law, you should remember that the area swept out in time is constant. But the important take home message from that is that the planets go faster when they're closer to the sun, slower when they're farther away. For any single planet. And in fact, there is an equation that relates the period, the period is the time for something to repeat. So it relates the period to the average distance between the planet and the sun. A there, the semi-major axis, is the average distance between the planet and the sun. And so the period in years is equal to the semi-major axis in astronomical units, Q, or excuse me, period squared, is equal to the center major axis cubed. So you can take any planet, well, let's just take this real quick. For the Earth, what is the semi major axis for the Earth, the average distance between the Earth and the Sun? One astronomical unit. It's on a quiz today. It's the definition. 
So for the Earth, you take one astronomical unit cubed, well that's still one. So the period squared is one, you square root that, and the period for the Earth is one year. That's why we use years in astronomical units. So if we take a planet like, let's say, Mars, I believe Mars is about one and a half astronomical units from the Sun. So if Mars is one and a half astronomical units from the Sun, how long is a year on Mars? How many Earth years does it take to go around the Sun? On the calculator. Yep, you take the 1.5 in cubic. Yes, you have to go sideways on my iPhone. And then square root. So about 1.84 Earth years should be a year on Mars if I'm correct that its semi-major axis is 1.5 astronomical units. Or we can go the other way. Um, what is it? Jupiter's year is about 10, its period is about 10 Earth years. And so if that's correct, then its period 10 squared is 100. And then we take the cube root of that to find its distance from the um, sun. And so the cube root of 100, is, I don't know. And of course, I could be very wrong. I could be thinking about the wrong number for Jupiter. But that's how this is useful. Obviously very useful. Only for things orbiting the sun, by the way. Now we get to Galileo Galilei. Gal I just like saying both his names. Um, <laughs> I've got a figure somewhere, it may not be in this year's, that has his name in Latin. It's like Galileus Galileus. It's more fun to say Galileo Galileo. Galileo, the son of Galileo, basically. He was really the father of modern science. He was the person who said, we need to test things. We, we can't say, this is a beautiful theory, so it must be true. That was Aristotle's way. We really need to test things. We need to, to find out if they're true by studying. Much like, you know, the, the Bereans who search the scriptures daily to see if these things were true. He also was a very obstinate man. He uh, greatly improved the telescope, but he didn't invent it. A lot of people think he invented it. We don't know who invented it. Um, we know it was invented by people, well, Dutch people. He heard about them being sold. He tried to go buy one. They were already gone. He got descriptions. He made his own based on the descriptions he had of others, and he improved them. He was the first one to use the telescope to observe and make scientific measurements of the sky. Right there. So things that he saw. He saw four moons for Jupiter. We call them the Galilean moons because he saw them. He observed them. He offered to name them after the four sons of the Medici family if they would sponsor him in research. They declined it, so they ended up with names of Eo, Callisto, Gemini, Europa, I put, did not put them in the writers like Eo, Europa, Gemini, Callisto, I, the last I still remember. And he observed that they changed positions dramatically from one night to next. This here is a photograph, a poor photograph, of his notebook where he illustrated the positions he saw of these moons orbiting Jupiter. This was significant because or geocentric models that everything orbits the Earth. Not just all the planets, but everything. And you're saying, no, not everything. There's things clearly orbiting Jupiter out there. So that was a major discovery because he used a telescope. He also observed the rings of Saturn. Almost like this. Almost. This is a picture more like what he actually saw, right? didn't have the resolution to see something like this. We saw something like this. Uh, crazy. Now, he offered to show, you know, look through my telescope and see. You know what a lot of people said? I'm not going to look through that telescope. It's a tool of the devil. It's going to bewitch me. I'll think I've seen something that's not really there. It will make me deny my God. So he met opposition because people knew this didn't agree with their theological view. This must be a tool of the devil that was fooling people. 
He also saw sunspots. Yes, he aimed his telescope at the sun and observed the sun with his telescope. In the process, clearly damaged his vision. But you have storms on the sun. The sun is not perfect, is what this showed. So he had things orbiting other stuff. The sun is not perfect. And then finally, and because this comes up in the homework, I have to get to it, the phases of Venus. If you had the Ptolemaic model, the Earth's here, the Sun's here, and Venus is orbiting this spot pinned to that line, then the Sun is always lighting up the side opposite the Earth. You're going to see Venus go through phases, yes, but it'll never be a full Venus. To have a full Venus, Venus is going to have to be on the opposite side of the Sun from us. And so it should have only limited phases according to the Ptolemaic model. But what he observed was a complete set of phases for Venus, such as would happen if Venus was going around the sun rather than going around the Earth with this epicycle. So we have lots of good information to say the, the geocentric model is incorrect. I will pick up in lab, because I'm going to lecture the first hour of lab again, with more on Galileo.